All right. So the title of the presentation is Grassroots Peace Building in LA. And before I begin speaking on what grassroots peace building is, I kind of wanted to give a brief introduction about what gang intervention and prevention is by definition. Um, so according to the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, uh, prevention programs target youth at risk of gang involvement and help reduce the number of youth who join gangs. Intervention programs are strategies that provide sanctions and services for younger youth who are actively involved in gangs to push them away from gangs. And I emphasize push them away from gangs because it's relevant um, for later in the conversation. Um, it's also important to understand that gang intervention and prevention efforts are rooted in principles of community policing that integrate the duties of law enforcement with community members. And so interventionists have to create incident reports that are shared with their partners, which include law enforcement, when they get called in to, um, to an incident. I also wanna emphasize that gang intervention and prevention programs are typically um, anti-gang programs. So what we're trying to, to differentiate is what is the difference between anti-gang, being anti-gang versus being anti-violence. And one of the main points in the gang intervention training manual um, that was produced out of the Center for Citizen Peacebuilding out of UCI is that gang intervention specialists are not anti-gang, but rather anti-violence. The history of gang intervention programs in LA specifically have been anti-gang, and a lot of them are rooted in um, rooted in law enforcement uh, specifically. So. We start with the gang resistance education and training program that has been active since 1991 and is run by the sheriff's department. We also have the LA Bridges program that ran between 1998 and 2008 and is run by LAPD and is a collaboration between LAUSD, um, community development department, the city attorney's office, community-based organizations and the mayor's office. Then um, funding starts to like change up a little and they start the gang reduction program in LA between 2003 and 2008, um, which starts to focus to integrate these uh, different aspects and focuses on prevention, intervention and suppression of gangs. Now what we have, um, and these are specifically like professional gang intervention um, programs, right? What is considered professional gang intervention. And so now it's gang reduction youth development grid um, that's been running since 2010 uh, and is a part of the office of mayor in collaboration with the LAPD and community partners. And grid predominantly focuses on gang intervention, prevention and support suppression tactics. So why is collaboration with law enforcement emphasizes one of the big questions I have and, and that we've been talking about with some of the panelists, which is, so we're trying to create a distinction between um, what is grassroots peace building and professional um, gang intervention. So really grassroots peace building is rooted in care and love for community and acknowledges the state that the state and law enforcement are actors in our continued oppression and criminalization. And so I'm gonna be talking about some of the treaties that have happened amongst neighborhoods that have been outside of this like traditional or professional gang intervention strategies. And so the first one that I'm gonna talk about is the 1986-87 peace agreements with the community youth services in Northeast LA. Um, I, I'm not gonna really go too much into depth, but these are just examples of grassroots peace building efforts that have happened in Latinx neighborhoods in LA um, since the 80s. In 1992, um, there was also a call from community elders to end drive-by shootings. And there was a lot of discussion in the media during that time um, about whether or not these efforts that were coming from community elders that were incarcerated had an impact on the shooting, gang-related shootings. And 
most of what was discussed is that, yeah, actually, this did have a huge impact on um, reducing gang related shootings in the community, right? And this is like outside of these efforts of with law enforcement. Between 1990 and 1996, there were various neighborhoods across California that was that were negotiating peace treaties and ceasefires. Um, some of the really big ones that I'll mention are peace treaties that were happening in Orange County with the United Gang Council. Um, and these are peace treaties that were just negotiated with uh, community members, right? Like organically starting with folks saying, you know, we don't wanna hurt each other anymore. The other really major um, peace treaty is the LA Valley in the 90s, um, is the LA Valley Peace Treaty that happens. And one of the um, community members that was one of the leaders uh, involved in this treaty said that was quoted in an LA Times article saying that he hoped that the gesture of peace by the gangs would bring them greater educational and job opportunities as well as respect, right? So this is elders negotiating um, because they care about the younger generation and they have influence, right? We also have in 2004, uh, the Tukey Protocol for Peace uh, that was um, negotiated amongst Avenues and Crips neighborhoods in LA. Also the 2012 uh, and the agreement to end hostilities that came out of organizing that was happening inside of California state prisons, the hunger strikes to end the long-term use of solitary confinement in 2016. And then most recently also the 2020 peace treaty um, in South Central among black and brown neighborhoods. And so, one of the things that's really important for me is trying to understand um, where does the funding come from, right? Like money has such a huge role in everything we do and we have to be so conscious of what we're reinforcing, right? When we choose or choose not to engage in certain um, programs. And so a lot of the funding for gang intervention is focused on law enforcement. And so really what they're doing as I had just mentioned, like the history, the, the main programs that are professional gang intervention are coming out of law enforcement. Um, and so they're receiving the funding for gang intervention and prevention. And so when we think about this like larger movement that's been happening, um, really starts taking up last year. Um, and we see gang interventionists, professional gang interventionists being quoted in a New York Times article saying, unlike the younger activists with Black Lives Matter, he says, working with the police is essential. We can't operate without the police. So I wouldn't say defund the police, right? So we have to really understand what does it mean when um, folks in our community are kind of going contrary to the larger discussions around um, removing funding from the police. Also, um, like these are conversations that have been happening across the US. This is like no way the first time that, that these conversations are being discussed. And it's especially been discussed in the context of anti-terror and community policing funding. There was large movements across the US to prevent the um, use of, of the Countering Violent Extremism Grant from the Department of Homeland Security. Um, and this was a grant that was being put out between 2010 and 2016. And in a recent report um, that came out regarding this, this grant, um, and as a result of the community or mobilization against the CVE, um, we find that organizations such as GRID and Homeboy Industries were trying to get, a, get access to some of this funding. Ultimately, in LA, because of the mobilization, people like Grid was not like didn't end up using those funds, and they were returned. But it's still like we're implicated. Gang intervention is implicated not just in um, like furthering policing, but also um, in like these like larger movements around racial profiling and police violence. 
So now kind of how they're revamping this grant is the targeted violence and terrorism prevention grant coming from Department of Homeland Security. Um, that's really pushing for more public safety funding. Uh, we're seeing it in the Biden-Harris American Rescue Plan that's specifically like funding, um, hiring law enforcement officials above pre-pandemic levels, paying overtime, um, and then also investing in technology and equipment. When we think about what this technology and equipment is doing, it's facilitating easier collaboration with FBI, ATF, DEA, US Marshals, and also um, transnational um, law enforcement. One of the points that I'd like to emphasize is that regardless of whether you work as a recognized gang interventionist or a grassroots peace builder, Black and brown people will continue to be targets of police intimidation and racial profiling. And we see that with the case of Larry Sanders, who um, is a gang interventionist with GRID and Chapter 2 in South LA, who was racially profiled and put on the Cal Gang database as someone who was already working as a professional gang interventionist in his community. He had to fight to be removed, but was, was and is still being profiled by the police. And then yesterday we heard Ben Taco Owen saying that some of the interventionists that work with him have also gotten caught up when they try to help people after an incident because they don't want to report to the police, right? And so some of the ways that we're seeing um, people, peace builders being um, targeted is through the use of RICO. Um, RICO, uh, the Federal Racketeering Influence Corrupt Organizations Act, it was initially enacted to um, target the Italian mob mafia, but has since the late 80s and 90s started to be used against um, gangs or what they consider gangs. Um, and so this legal scholar, Bonnie, has argued that the RICO statute provides adequate and effective way of combating gangs um, if they qualify as enterprises, show a pattern of racketeering, and if they're disrupting interstate commerce and it doesn't need to be uh, economic commerce. But we're also finding now, um, more recently, legal scholars are finding that there is racial bias in the use of RICO statutes against street gangs. About a third of RICO cases between 2001 and 2011 have involved street gangs, of which about 86% are primarily affiliated with Black, Latino, or Asian um, people. Let's see. Okay. So what we're seeing is the criminalization of peace builders. An example is one is a 2009 RICO on MS-13 that involved um, Homies Unidos. The executive director, Alex Sanchez, was originally named in this RICO indictment, um, but was eventually was actually not convicted in the end. Um, in 2015, we see a RICO um, on a prison gang involving Homeboy Industries. Uh, this was really interesting because there was a peace treaty that had been happening with three neighborhoods um, in Northeast LA. And what ended up happening was that um, some of the leaders of the peace treaty um, had also been receiving services at Homeboy Industries and got caught up. And so that's how like Homeboy Industries gets caught up in this RICO. And so their official statement says, we will vigorously investigate these items. And when contacted by law enforcement, we will fully cooperate with any inquiries. This is alarming because we're trying to push people to continue to uplift these like peace agreements. And we can't uplift people doing peace building work if we know that they're going to continue to be criminalized, not just by the state and law enforcement, but also within our like community organizations that are saying that are said to be helping us, right? And then also in 2012, in 2020, there was a RICO against a Crips neighborhood involving a peace builder at the Youth Justice Coalition, Paul Wallace, and is, who is currently still incarcerated. 
And so next, I'm just going to show some um, some graphs using data that was collected from um, a different from a legal scholar. Um, the citation is below. But so here we're seeing that predominantly Latino and Black uh, neighborhoods are the ones that are receiving higher rates of indictments um, with the RICO. What we're also seeing is since 2006, a drastic increase in the number of federal RICO indictments on gangs. And so what's happening? Well, one is that in 2004, um, there was a peace treaty, the Tookie Protocol for Peace that had been happening. And one of the neighborhoods that was involved in this, the Avenues, had a RICO indictment in 2009, which had one of the highest uh, number of named people on the indictment with 88 people named. And just to give some context, like the RICO indictments can range from two people being named to 104 people being named. We're also in 2006 having anti-immigration and anti-terror legislation that's leading to massive protests where the Border Protection Anti-Terrorism and Illegal Immigration Control Act of 2005 had just passed. Um, but we're also seeing more, um, more RICOs happening with gangs that are involved in um, fighting white supremacist organizations and also um, negotiating peace treaties. And then just some concluding thoughts. This is happening at an international scale, right? Like gangs, like not just in LA, but also in El Salvador are negotiating peace treaties. And so what we need to do is decriminalize informal community organizations and destigmatize peace building and peace builders. Um, we know that retaliatory violence decreases when community members implement harm reduction tactics. So can we imagine how much more we can accomplish without policing? So now I'm going to pass it off to Michael, who's going to talk a little bit more about what grassroots peace building looks like based on his experiences, not just outside in the streets, but also inside prison. Thank you. Thank you, Nadia. And thanks, everybody, for joining us today. My personal experience with neighborhoods starts from as a kid growing up in the era of the war on drugs, the war on gangs, over policing, mass incarceration, and the school to prison pipeline. All of the things that we now know, definitively know, did not work and instead created a lot of poverty and oppression within my community and so many other black and brown communities where we begin to see neighborhood conflict, territorial beef, which was created by the states and its agents during the war on drugs and funneling of cocaine and AK-47s into our communities by the government's Iran-Contra Oliver North scandal that we all know now to be fact and not just fiction. This militarization of the police and so-called drug and gang task force created a lot of violence and fear in black and brown communities. Nevertheless, in the early 90s, I saw a beautiful turning point and witnessed as a young person, one of the first and largest peace treaties in LA County through the work of Blinky Rodriguez and others in the San Fernando Valley area. This was amazing to see rival neighborhoods coming together to barbecue and play softball in the park. However, I didn't see any law enforcement or organizations that work with law enforcement involved. I saw community people who were doing this without any funding, but instead were doing their own fundraising. It was families and people both inside prison and outside working together to end drive-by shootings and create peace. Having seen this happen, was amazing, but the state created segregation and state created violence that led to so much black and brown tensions and violence inside prisons that also seeped out into the streets was fully alive when I entered the prison system in 1998. But while I was inside, I also saw one of the most precedential peace treaties inside the California prison system in its entire history. The, 26, the 2016 statewide prisoner hunger strikes that to end solitary confinement and the end of hostilities agreement that brought all factions and races in prison together to fight against the inhumane conditions and treatment in solitary confinement. The peace agreement and solitary and solidarity between black and brown was especially important to me 
and the work I now do out here with YJC as a legal coordinator and peace builder at Truco's Justice Center. As we all know, after the death of Nipsey Hussle and the move of YJC to our new location sparked the need to build peace in that area of South Central, where we are now situated, which was plagued by black and brown animosity, violence, and racism. The same people from inside who created the black and brown peace were able to be coordinated into creating the peace treaty that exists today. This was something Grid and others said cannot be done because they could not be a part of it. But in the end, my good friend and fellow peace builder, Paul Wallace, who was a central part of this peace building effort was arrested on RICO charges. At the very same time, he was one of the most pivotal coordinators of this historical black and brown peace treaty in South Central. Having seen all this firsthand and living this, even now today as a peace builder, um, I would just like to close and say gang intervention and prevention pushes for people involved in neighborhoods to be changed, to reform them, have them remove their tattoos and assimilate. Similar to the Indian boarding schools where indigenous people were forced to disavow their tribes, not speak their languages and not dress or act like an Indian. The gang injunctions were the new Indian Removal Act laws meant to confine and restrict us to reservations with curfews and dress codes, all leading to the school to prison pipeline and mass incarceration. In summary, we have to look at these systems that claim to save or reform, change, or reform and change alleged gang members as furthering white settler colonial institutions that are rooted in the elimination, extermination, removal, and assimilation of indigenous and black people in the US. So I hope people think about this really more deeper than what they just see on the surface. And I would like to pass it over now today from YJC who was a peace builder and who is doing the work as a peace builder and cops off campus at our, at our high school at Chuco's Justice Center. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I introduced myself earlier um, already. Uh, just wanted to say some things. So these, some of these things have been touched on already, but we do know that there is um, a need for um, defunding and reimagining the police and all the money that they get. Uh, they're not doing a good job, like Michael said. It's stuff that's not working. So we need to kind of uh, reimagine it and come up with a different plan because um, they've kind of been like a crime committed by the LAPD um against these kids like uh if we were given our kids no food not enough resources blah 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 we would uh you know get in trouble for like neglect or uh endangerment so uh they're doing the same thing and just locking up all the kids uh just basically it's just like uh you know sweeping the stuff up under the bed like you know when you were a little kid you're not cleaning up you're not doing anything you just sweeping it under the rug. So instead of doing that, you know, we need to invest some of this, this money and these funds, all these huge amounts of dollars that just go into, uh, you know, funding the police and the system. I think uh, we need to uh, come up with some answers to what to do with these kids, like jobs, training, uh, sports, and access to different resources um, because they're basically just, using like a job security thing by, you know, criminal, criminalizing and dehumanizing and uh, demonizing these kids so that they can just look like they're so out of control and there's a need to have law enforcement and uh, guns and stuff like this in our schools and in our communities when it's not really necessary. We, there weren't always cops and there doesn't need to always be cops. You know, we had other, uh, situations going on um in society so you know we, we really don't need cops we that just feeds the school to prison pipeline and it just teaches the kids the um you know the ftp you know what i mean f the police mentality early on so uh, you know they're not they're not giving out uh bubble gums and uh you know baseball cards and stuff no more they're not you know, having little league and stuff like that. They're just teaching these kids how to live life under the gun, basically. 
and uh, in the schools. So you really don't need that. And uh, it's, it's hard to, to do anything to focus knowing that, you know, you're, you're kind of like in a, an occupied space instead of just being at school and free to learn and just be a kid. And, uh, you know, they want to be, everybody wants to be tough on crime and all that kind of stuff, but they really need to be finding out how to uh, come up with new ways to prevent crime. And I think if people have resources, nobody wants to be a criminal. Nobody wants to have to go get down how they live. You know, they would like to, you know, have a generational wealth like everybody else, you know what I mean? So they don't have to do all that. You know, because they, but they never did anything for, for us. All they did was arrest us and then that got us on probation. And then, you know, you never get off probation. And if you stay on probation, then you're going to be in jail. And then when you get off, you're going to be on probation. And, uh, you know, they even have voluntary probation for some of these kids that we just got rid of that like earlier last year, but they had voluntary probation. They weren't even committing a crime and they put them on that probation just to get them in the system and hold on to them because it's, it's hard to get out, man. Uh, I know just recently uh, we lost uh, a guy, like a kind of a, a legendary uh, figure in the gang community. His name is Monster Cody. And I heard it said that, I, and he was older than me. I'm 49. He's like probably, you know, years me, older than me. And he said that, from the time he was like 12 years old until he died, he was never off of probation. That's crazy. You know what I mean? That's just, just keeping that chain on all that, all that time, you know, just one foot in prison like that. It's tough to get down like that. So uh, that's just what they're trying to do, man. And um, they don't come from the neighborhood, so they don't share common experiences, common fears and stuff like that. When they show up, they're just showing up to, uh, you know, uh, you know how they do, man. And they're not listening, and they just want to be in control instead of listening. You, know, you know, finding out what's going on. And you know, peace builders are from the area, so chances are we know that kid if we show up. We know him, so we don't come. You know, I mean, grabbing guns and just uh, having bad intentions like that, like the cops often do. And uh, you know, peace builders, we're not armed. The cops are armed. We're not armed. We don't have lethal weapons like guns. We don't have less lethal, non-lethal. We don't have chemical weapons. We don't have batons and all like that. It's just coming from a, a position of respect, of love, and just listening, understanding, and, and, and resolving instead of instigating and, and, and escalating conflicts the way they do. You know, um, cops are always talking about, you know, I was so scared. I was scared for my life. You know what I mean? No, he was so, he was so big. Oh, black. Oh, you know, he was so, I thought he was on, you know, PCP, you know what I mean? Black and brown. You know what I mean? And, and, and if, if you're scared, man, uh, go, go to church. If you're scared, don't be a cop in a black neighborhood, a black, brown neighborhood, if you're scared of black and brown people. But we all know, they just trying to get their wings, you know what I mean? Get their smoking gun, tattoo, and all like that. It's just gotten down to that, bro. And we know how many gangs are in law enforcement. Forget about it, man. But uh, yeah, man, uh, they, they, they shouldn't be in school. They shouldn't be responding to domestic violence calls. They're not counselors. Why are they going there? And at nine times out of 10, they just want to arrest. Somebody's going to jail. Well, you know what I mean? I got I to gotta take one of you to jail. Somebody's going to jail. You know, uh, uh, they shouldn't be responding to mental health calls because they're not doctors. They shouldn't be responding to even traffic uh, calls and tickets. They're not experts. To, you know what I mean? What are they? So come on, what, what, it's, it's much better ways to do this. And peace builders come from the neighborhood so they know what's needed. They talk to the people, they know what the people need and we can provide the resources better than, than cops can. And uh, just to go also into um, the last thing with uh, Alex and Doc and all that, it's, it's a, a tough thing, man, when uh, people of color are identified as leaders because we know how they fear that. And, 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 and they're, gonna, they're gonna bring you down, man, when they find out that about you, because uh, you're doing the work that they can't do. 
You know what I mean? They're saying, oh, we're trying to do all this. Oh, it's out of control. No, no, it's not. Let, let We can control ourselves, man. We can handle ourselves if given the opportunity. And the way they look at it is like, if you can stop a riot, then you can start a riot. And if you can stop a war, then you can start a war. So that's the way they're looking at people like, and you know, I, I, I fear for my brother, Mike, you know what I mean? Cause you know, I, I know what you're doing and I know they don't like this kind of process, this progress that you're doing, bro. But I commend you on, you know what I mean? What you've been through and what you're doing always, you know, much respect to you, man. And much love and uh, yeah, that's it, everybody. Um, thank you all so much. This is already just in a short, concentrated time, so much better than what we often get or maybe ever get with this dialogue. And I hope this is kind of more a sign of things to come and a, a kind of precedent that we can normalize around what this dialogue is supposed to look and sound like. One question I wanna, I wanna throw back to everybody, um, something I think about a lot, and then those thoughts got very reanimated by this presentation is, you know, I grew up in LA too. I recall throughout um, everything, everything that Nalia said, uh, the kind of really fluid engagement that people had around peace work, the different iterations of it, the different iterations of it all over our, our county, um, <clears throat> is, that it, is that it worked. And not only did neighborhood peace work have a positive effect, but just investment in localized community services had an effect. Uh, during the HIV crisis, there was an investment in creating more localized access to public health. So there was more family planning services and, and clinical services and case management services because people on the ground were smart enough to take whatever you know crumbs they were getting to address a global health crisis and use it to also just meet the needs of community. And as a result, there was a lot of um, organizing around issues of peace and violence, but also just issues of health. And we know that this is actually an overlap and should have never been siloed. And we also learned that part of why that work was so effective and brought about such positive impacts in the community was because it was allowed to exist outside of the supervision of the courts. It was allowed to exist outside of law enforcement having any presence in it. And the most dynamic um, peace work or gang intervention work or anything you want to call it happened through those health spaces. Um, which is something that has has germinated for me ever since in, in our current, you know, ATI work and the victories of things like the Justice LA campaign. That's been emphasized throughout the process and has really helped us try to nullify the influence of law enforcement. Now, the reason I ask that and the reason I bring that up is that this is, you know, was a long time ago. We didn't have access to the democratization of information that we have now, the channels that we can carve out our own through tools like social media, complicated though they may be spreading though they may be, even toxic though they may be, they're also have for a platform for a lot of self-reporting. And, and out of that, the development of narrative to point to successes or point to the realities of state violence. People are now understanding, like you said, Mike, it, it's, it, was it was always fact, it was never fiction. Things they used to call conspiracies were always facts. And that encroachment of state violence into our lives in the form of arrest, in the form of probation, in the form of family separation that fractures any opportunity, not only for generational wealth, but for generational skills building. The person that was supposed to teach you how to fix a car is now gone. Things like that, that really uh, fracture community's ability to sustain, don't get, don't get talked about. And now that's being understood. But at the same time, when all that success happened and I saw things get safer and I was a kid and I saw things get safer. Um, right when that happened, we had, <clears throat> you know, the carpet bagging police, Bill Bratton come in and say, broken windows policing is the reason things have gotten safer. We already had the 94 crime bill, which was like the composite of everything that had been workshopped here in LA first, by the way, the expansion of statutes for things like three strikes, the expansion of statutes for gang databases, the expansion of statutes for um, mandatory minimums and, and uh, extended supervision and so on and so forth the militarized policing that got went all the way back you know, to the Daryl Gates era and so on and so forth. Those things um, were all of a sudden given the credit and then broken windows policing. So the credit of the community was literally co-opted for more police, for an expansion of budgets, for more incarceration, and for this really perverse thing that, that we've all witnessed where we're in 40 years now 
of Reaganomics, 40 years of political austerity, of draining all the resources from community infrastructure. The only local entity that has survived that has been law enforcement. The only global entity has been the military. Um, so the reason I bring this up and the question I wanna throw to you all is, what do we do about that now? Like we saw how we have to tap into our own experiential memory and just ask folks to believe us that, that it worked. Now we have an opportunity to actually export the narrative in, in a tangible way through text, through digital media, et cetera. How do we fight that fight? Because we know that, for example, the LA County Sheriff's Department, just, just one department all name, has a $24 million a year budget for comms. And that's how we see the saturation of you know, fear-mongering media around a rise in gun violence and gang violence, and et cetera. So how are we incorporating that into our strategy? Because we do have all, all the kind of, everything's been proven now. We have the knowledge, we have the facts on our side. Um, but how do we build that infrastructure or fight for that narrative, including with folks close to us who, who may have accepted the police presence and try to work around it or navigate it or, or negotiate it? I guess I can go first. Um, I would definitely say just from my experience and um, working on the ground with peace builders who have been doing this for literally for free, just from the kindness of their heart, right? Um, if you supply these people livable wages and give them salaries, right, as they do grid um, interventionists or professional or, or county and LAPD supported interventionists, um, people would have more livable wages. They would be able to do this work uh, full time and invest in it and invest in our communities, but also having the protection, like legal protections of like lawyers and law firms that, you know, continually want to be a part of this, but never uh, center the directly impacted communities, like be out there to represent these people, start bail funds for these community peace builders, um, that protection and, and, and you know, show up for their court dates or if they do get arrested, you know, or the police show up, show up like they do for protests, like the NLG does. I think these are some of the things, but mostly the main thing is creating livable wages for peace builders in the community because they are the key to this. And if we don't support them, we don't give them livable wages, then it's not going to work. But yet we can give police who aren't from these communities who get paid to beat up our community, who get paid to shoot our community, to harass and discriminate against our community. Why can't we pay peace builders in our community? This way we don't need cops. We have peace builders like Dave and other people in the community, the OGs, the elders who are respected, not interventionists like Grid who came into our community and said, we're sorry and did a whole report, right? They, they did a whole report to the county talking about how black and brown unity and peace would never happen in South Central where our new Justice Center is located. They couldn't do it. But the people who did make it happen, they didn't get paid. They did it out of the kindness of their heart, but always having to watch their back to know, like Dave said, they were gonna be targeted. Like what happened to Paul, Doc. So we need livable wages and protection, legal protection. Um, I'd like to just like re-emphasize this legal protection aspect um, because I mean, with the RICO, like people are being snatched up all the time, right? And very easily. Um, yesterday, there was a panel um, where Latanya Ward uh, talked a bit about how um, older folks had gotten RICO'd in her neighborhood in LA and they were peace builders. They were people that were the leadership in her community and were the ones that were talking to the younger homies and telling them like, hey, like, we need to stop having like such heated like beefs, right? Um, and then also Ingrid from A New Way of Life talking about how a whole block was literally disappeared as a result of a RICO in her neighborhood, right? And so it's like elders, community elders, like the people that are most respected within these communities are the ones that are being disappeared um and we're losing our leadership right and so making sure that people are protected i think is a, a really big aspect of it uh, yeah I, I would say uh yeah i would agree with that that um 
definitely you need to uh, have peace builders backs for having uh, the community's backs. It's just, uh, you know, just a balance. Um, so a question that I have too, kind of on the heels of the last question, um, and this one, I don't even like have, I don't even like asking it because it brings up just the, it's a, it's one about frustration, which is again, mentioning the amount of dollars, the amount of taxpayer dollars, public dollars, um, the irony of that, that go into propaganda, go into a, a massive propaganda effort which I do want to add isn't necessarily working. A um, couple of examples, like we're having a huge propaganda effort that's saying, you know, on the heels of a shift in this country where people do want a change, where people are acknowledging that the system of policing, the system of state violence, the system, the carceral system, to whatever degrees people understand it in its totality, has not made anybody safer, but rather been an obstacle to safety. That, that question is resonating in a way it never has before, I think in like the mass kind of public discourse. And so as a result, there has been a counter surge in propaganda. It was reminding me a lot of like the eighties and nineties and the kind of Willie Horton politics of the time, the constant fear mongering. We're seeing that again, we're swimming in it actually, it's constant. And again, it's important to remember that it's a funded effort, it's not by accident. Um, and because newsrooms across the country tend to be run by folks who are not from these communities, who see it as at best, and I mean at best, they see it as a both sides issue at best. They don't, they don't see it as uh, the fact that the crisis is policing in the carceral system itself. That's the crisis. Um, but I do think the public does see that more than they ever have. I mean, Measure J passed in Los Angeles with 65% of the vote. <clears throat> uh, Larry Krasner just won a re-election in Philadelphia with 65% of the vote. Voting you know, the uh, the postscript on voting is far more accurate read than polling ever can be. And I mean, I don't want to digress and talk about what a faulty, faulty kind of fake piece of scholarship, let alone non-scientific and just waste of time polling is. Um, but it is important to know that that constantly gets leveraged to also fuel a narrative that says, A, people actually do want the police and B, um, you know, without them, we're not safe. How do, how do you, as our, as our speakers right now, I'm asking you all individually, um, outside of the spaces where we are all aligned, have the, those conversations? What is, that looking like, what is that looking like for you right now? Um, I think I can start. <laughs> um, so a, a lot of my work focuses on Central America and gang violence in Central America. Um, and this is like something that I have been in conversation with many people in my community um, in LA um, and like the larger Central American community in LA is about um, how peace treaties have been criminalized in El Salvador and in Honduras and in Guatemala. Um, those like peace building efforts have been criminalized. People um, have been incarcerated, killed because of their affiliation with a peace treaty. Um, and so one of the things that I feel very important in my circles, because there's a huge prop propaganda campaign to uh, stigmatize right gang members and call them terrorists and say all sorts of things about um, what they think a gang member is and who they are. Um, and so just like having conversations with community members, like with my family, right, like um, knowing that like on social media, the narratives around gangs in El Salvador is like we should just kill them all. So how do we humanize people, right? And then at the same time tell people in that context, um, we don't need to criminalize when they want to also build peace. And I think like those conversations around um, destigmatizing gangs and destigmatizing um, neighborhoods, um, people in general that are involved in these sorts of activities um, in El Salvador has had like a really big impact. One of the things that we, and a lot of it is just like how we name things, right? Like, how do we talk about certain things? 
right? And so when we talk about in the Salvadoran context, um, what is gang prevention or violence prevention, when we start to talk about it as um, being issues that are rooted in um, discrimination, in like class inequality, right? Um, people are more likely to want those and push for those programs. And like, that's kind of a trend that's happening in El Salvador was happening. There's kind of been some backpedaling um, in terms of public opinion on gangs uh, because of these propaganda campaigns to say like, we shouldn't be working with gang members uh, or people involved in um, allegedly involved in gangs, right? So I think a lot of it is just like speaking with our family, speaking with the people closest to us, trying to destigmatize um, these behaviors and like the response, right? When people want to call for jobs and education for their for their young people and for also the older generation, our leaders. Thank you. Uh, Mike and Dave, how are those conversations looking and feeling for you when people bring that to you or when you're responding to that? Well, um, you know, there's always has been and always going to be like um, a, uh, whoever is in control is going to use uh, the media and to slander the other one and all like that. You know, we see it every time during election time, these campaigns, you know, the Muzz thing, and it's like funny just to see how, you know what I mean? All of this stuff that they do. But uh, ever since like uh, Colors, you know, I don't know if you guys remember that movie Colors, um, that's, that's they, they put that out there, you know, and they, they use that media, they use um, TV and commercials and, uh, you know, people just believe what they see on that screen. And they just, uh, you know, blame gangs for everything, for all the problems instead of uh, the systemic problems that lead to, uh, you know, people joining gangs and that lead to gangs existing. Um, you know, the images of uh, black and brown, all they show is us either, you know, getting arrested, you know, we getting in trouble or, you know, me, you know, uh, you know, with with, uh, you know, Hispanics, you know, all oh, this drugs and they bringing drugs over, uh, you know, and, you know, what, what Trump said, a lot of people believe that. And that's, you know, got him, got him elected, man, on that, that hatred, you know what I mean? Because a lot of people buy into that, you know? So, and they, they use it to spread it all over the world, like, um, like they did with smoking, you know, <laughs> cigarettes and stuff, you know, got people all over the world smoking cigarettes because John Wayne's, you know, was smoking them or something like that, Cary Grant or somebody, you know what I mean? So they all always use that, uh, that tool uh, to, 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 divide, to divide us, to conquer us, you know what I mean? Keep us from getting together, you know, we get together. Oh, uh, Mike, man, uh, you know, what did the white man do to your people? Oh man, you know, he wiped us out, man, stole, you know, killed all of everything, stole all the land, isn't that, damn. You know, uh, Nyla, what, what, what happened with your people? Oh man, they came over here and did this and that, damn. You know what they did to me? Oh man, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we got together and realized who the common enemy is, you know, it's over. So they have to do these kind of things. They're gonna keep these things in place and keep it going. It's just up to us to kind of, you know, reach who we can reach and teach who we can teach you know, to, to uh, kind of counter that. that. That's all I can really, really say. You know, it's, a, it's a, a tight plan that they have, man. And like you said, it's working. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, man. It's, 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 it's tough, man, to, to, to fight against that, man. You know, but we fighting. Yeah, I definitely think that the media has a lot to do with it, right? Like on the one hand, you know, America romanticizes, uh, uh, you know, being a gangster, but if you're a, a flashy gangster like Bugsy Siegel or Al Capone, right, or Scarface even, and showing this to young kids such as myself, especially brown and black kids growing up in poverty, growing up in the projects, and you see like, you know, I want to be like Tony Montana, right? Everybody loves Tony Montana. You know, you see t-shirts now, it's cool. But on the other hand, they want to criminalize people who are trying to live and, and, and catch that all-American dream, right? Um, of, of coming from ashes to, to, to from, from as uh, Biggie said, from ashy to classy, right? Um, we can't all live like that, right? Because they hate on us. As soon as we reach the top, oh, 
you know, he's a thug, he's this, or, 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 or brown and black people are gangsters. We're not the, the romanticized uh, Bugsy Seagulls and, and Al Capones and, you know, where the uh, low life thugs, right? So it's easy for them to, to, uh, to stereotype us and to stigmatize us and to criminalize us and even demonize us when you have people like Trump saying, you know, uh, Mexico sending us their worst, their gang members and, and MS-13, they're chopping up kids and all this fear mongering, right? Um, so yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword of, of the media because they want to romanticize being a gangster, you know, balling, et cetera, even, even the music that we listen to but on the other hand, they want to criminalize it and, and lock people up and, and separate families for it, right? And stigmatize people. But I think what really needs to be done is we need to find some journalists that have real heart, that believe in abolition, that, uh, you know, going against the, the status quo and show stories like Dave as being a peace builder for a high school in a community of black and brown people where there's always tension, right? But he's able to, to de-escalate and be a peace builder without cops on our campus, without cops at this high school, as he said, without weapons. Um, I think this needs to be shown that it can be done, that peace treaties can be um, had in the streets between black and brown, between rival neighborhoods. We can stop drive-bys, we can stop, you know, mothers from crying at funerals under over unnecessary uh, violence in the, in the hoods, right? We could tell the youth, hey, don't paint on these people's walls, don't mess with these people's cars like have respect for our elders, right? But they're not showing those stories. And those are the stories that need to be shown instead of the criminalization, stereotyping and uh, demonizing of us. Thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> you made such a good point at the very end too about the way this country has romanticized. Um, and I'm sure it's been other places, but you know, I can speak to here the romanticization of the outlaw and the outlaw archetype and the outlaw culture. And it's its own conversation, which, you know, maybe we can reconvene another time and really like dig in. Cause I think the cultural conversation around the outlaw archetype is really important because the, the one of the most harmful narratives in this country is the rags to riches narrative. They can do it. You can do it. Why are you mad at Jeff Bezos? He made his own money, things like that. It, it creates this, um, what a lot of people refer to in this culture as rugged individualism and the myth that anybody does anything alone. We're all interdependent. Nobody, nobody has achieved wealth without, uh, without the utilization of the infrastructure that we all contribute to. And the outlaw, the outlaw archetype is very much a component of that. The idea of someone going out and getting something on their own, the idea of, a, of having the courage to break through social conditions and achieving something by any means necessary, get rich or die trying. It's a very complicated, very complicated, archetype that I think has impacted us deeply that, that, that this country on one hand it's just a great point Mike on one hand it like romanticizes it fetishizes it and then on the other hand criminalizes it whenever it can and levies state violence you know in a in a truly brutal fashion at those who who actually embody it so uh, something for us to put in the parking lot um, I'd like to, you know, we have 10 minutes left. I would like to open it up to the participants here. Um, please just just throw your um, questions into the chat and and I'll, I'll facilitate best I can. Um, our panelists might just want to see them and respond. So let's just go there um, and and please feel free to, to ask questions of this amazing group of voices that we're here with today. I'll also say there's not a lot of us and I love a small groups or a gift. So you can also just take yourself off mute and ask the question too. Oh uh, yeah, so I actually had a question um, regarding like the peace builders. Um, well, first and foremost, thanks to all the presenters and Lex for facilitating this. Um, the question that, I, that I've been having regarding like, the peace building is given this kind of shift in the landscape with, with the prisons, uh, specifically in California, where you are now seeing a lot more people going into the S and Y yards, the sensitive knee yards. And oftentimes that like loses the credibility of folks and who they could like interact 
like how has that given the fact that the SNY yards are like growing um, in the you know Department of Corrections in California? How is that affecting like the peace building out in the streets? Nadia or Dave, I guess I could take Michael, this one. Michael. I know you probably um, gonna let us get in there first, but uh, no, but I think there's there's like two really great points, right? Like so, one is again Indian boarding schools, the Indian Removal Act. None of this is is new, right? Mass incarceration is not new. Um, the erasure and assimilation of people. So one way that the state turns people into state agents or breaks them, right? Just like they did with the Indians, erase your tattoos, you don't speak your language, don't wear your, your native dress anymore, right? So by breaking people and telling them, the only way, if you're a lifer, the only way we'll let you out when you go to parole board and the only way you can convince us that you are no longer a threat to society is if you denounce your gang, denounce gang membership, denounce people that are in gangs. And if you want to go home and you want programs and services that will help you go home, like college programs, like arts and corrections programs, this SNY yard has those for you. It's like a carrot on a stick, right? If you want a program, if you want to you know, go home, then you become a state agent. But a lot of people don't know in order to do that for most people, unless you have a case that you're a former judge, you're a former police officer, or you're a sex offender, you're not going to be automatically put in SNY unless you want to drop out of a gang and give information, what they call debriefing, to gang investigators, which is only going to be, yes, you're going to save yourself. You're going to go free, but you have to give a list of people Right. And those same prisoners, whether inside or outside, whoever you're giving information about, even if you don't know anything, they will pressure you up so bad that they, you will begin to make stuff up. And this is recorded document, court documents in the um, the Ashner settlement litigation. Right. Uh, uh, regarding the hunger strikes and the end of solitary confinement and the use of debriefing, forcing people to tell on themselves and others violating the Eighth Amendment and their own Fifth Amendment in order to go home. That is cruel and unusual punishment, saying, Sergio, if you want to go home, you have to tell me about Lex, everybody on this on this panel. And you're like, well, I may only know a couple of people. Oh, then you really don't want to go home, huh? So you start making stuff up. Now, to save your own skin and to go home, you're sacrificing all these other people who that information that you gave, and even if you didn't give information, is going to be used to keep them either in solitary confinement or begin uh, uh, investigations and cases against people. So you're, all you're doing is perpetuating mass incarceration. You're perpetuating uh, the use of solitary confinement, gang labeling of other people that you gave information for, all to come home. Now you come home, we saw what happened to Nipsey Hussle. Now, nobody in this space that is talking about revolution, talking about fighting against the system, fighting up for black and brown, empowerment and freedom is gonna be somebody that's willing to work with the state. Although I could see the, 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 the argument that, oh, I was pressured, the state does this to people. Yes, that's why we need to shut down the state. That's why we need to abolish the prison system, the gang validation system, the debriefing policies, et cetera, et cetera. Because they know if they could break men down and women down into becoming informants, they ne no longer have to worry about those individuals. And then once they're on the streets paroled, they have to check in with their pro officer. The pro officer might be, hey, you work for such and such org, or we want you to infiltrate this org. That's what they did to the Black Panthers, right? Infiltrate. That's what they did to the Brown Berets, agent provocateurs, state agents, informants. So, I mean, that can speak for itself in history how state informants, people who are called former anything, who are working with the police, who are working with these agents, are not productive to this work. And I feel very bad for those people. It's sad that they had to go through that. It's sad that the system forced them to do that, that that was the only way they could fight to get out. But I say, I endured the hunger strikes. I went two months without eating. I went through everything, getting written up. 
I fought against the system. I resisted. I didn't conform, right? I sacrificed myself and I continue to sacrifice my freedoms by doing this work, being targeted, as Dave said, is look what happened to, to Doc, whose office is right across from me. It could happen to me as well, right? But I'm not gonna just fold or buckle or conform because it's easier, because it's safer. I'm gonna sacrifice myself for this fight. I'm gonna refuse to work with the police and I'm gonna continue to, to fight against the system. And we all know what happened to Nip Nipsey Hussle, who killed him, somebody who came into his circle, who was no longer wanted in, in the community, who was an informant, allegedly, and Nipsey told him to leave. And what happened? He was scorned. He came back and killed him. I just, it, it's not productive. The proof is in the history of it. Look what happened to the Black Panthers. I think state agents are not good for this work. And, and the state should not be turning people into agents. There should be other ways for people to get out. Um, I just want to say one thing, too, uh, is that these confidential informant information that is generated by um, law enforcement inside prisons can also then be used against people who are involved in peace building outside for a RICO indictment. And well, they don't even have to be outside. They can be indicted on a RICO while they're still incarcerated in prison, in state prison. Um, so, right. So it's like this information is not only being used to... Um, criminalize you within the prison system, it can then be used uh, in a federal RICO too. Um, so we, are, we are approaching time and that was a really important question. And it's one, another one where it's like, these should actually be like a series of, this should be just an ongoing dialogue because, um, the, the kind of creation of a space, the offering folks something that they think might benefit them in exchange for either fracturing a movement, harming a movement, or simply watering down a movement, or helping them mediate a movement back to the center, or back into the status quo's, you know, status quo tends to carve out little spaces for the performance of dissent, for example. Uh, there, there can be a lot of money in that. There can be, you know, what people might feel are rewards in that, but only for a couple folks and then a bunch of other folks who might be lining up hoping to get those rewards. And it's delicate to talk about for a number of reasons. And it's also delicate to talk about because it's hard not to be reductive about, about it or just end up venting because it's like so harmful. Um, but it's like it's it truly a, a huge factor in everything that we do. So it, it's a really, really good point and a really, really good question. Um, it's been a really pleasure, been a real pleasure listening to you. And um, I just hope this is the first step. I hope this is this is the beginning of kind of how we shape the way these conversations happen. It's it's like nobody ever, some I say all the time, like nobody ever forgets who told them the truth. And if we can just continue to build these spaces where where consistent truth telling is happening, it's the most, it's to me just the most empowering thing that can happen for everybody collectively. So thank you all so much for joining us. And um, thank you all for participating uh, in this space. And Dave and Nalia and Mike, thank you for the work that you're doing and the leadership that you're providing. It's one thing to just talk. And I don't mean to say talking is not important because sometimes it's underrated, talking is important but also being resources, being educational resources, being legal resources, being leaders around peace building. We all know that we're here because somebody gave us a safe space at some point in our life where our ideas got to thrive, where our ideas got to be protected. And that's why we survive. And you know, I, I, I feel that gratitude every day. So I wanna extend that back to you all. And I hope we get to talk again soon. For sure, thank you. And thank you everybody. Really appreciate y'all. Thanks. Peace, everybody. All right. Later Bye. on. Thank you.